Going into round eight of the Tata Steel Masters tournament, Magnus Carlsen was a point behind the leader, Shakriya Mamadyarov. Now in round eight, Carlsen was playing Garwin Jones. On paper, he's one of the weakest players in the tournament, but he's, he's actually having a very good event. But Carlsen really had to target him. He was playing with the white pieces, so this was a, a good opportunity to try and forge forward in the tournament. Carlson opened with an e4, and Jones, instead of playing e5, he went back to his old favourite, the Sicilian, and in fact, he didn't back down at all. He ventured the dragon variation against Carlson. Well, first of all, I think it's interesting that Carlson goes in for an open Sicilian. Um, you know, a clear indication that he wants a, a big fight on the chessboard and is prepared to take a risk. And it is a big risk against Garwain, who I think we could say he's one of the world's leading experts on this variation. Was it wise for Magnus to play into his opponent's strength? Let's have a look. So... Carlson plays one of the main lines, Carlson in queenside, but also play bishop c4, of course. But the idea of Carlson in queenside is to just leave the bishop on f1 and plough forward on the kingside with h4 without bothering to put the bishop around here. The problem is if you don't bring out this bishop to c4, then that allows black to break in the centre with d5. So this is a very well-known variation. And here, well, Garwin is an expert in this particular line. And here, well, e5 is possible, but this is a very popular line, which, uh, yeah, Garwin knows extremely well with black. But Carlson played, instead of capturing on d5, he just came back with a queen. And this is also one of the main lines um, and in some ways much sharper because it keeps more tension in the position, more pieces on the board. e5 from black, take on c6 and take on d5. And if c takes d5, then bishop g5, and, and this is well known to be better for white. But instead, knight takes d5. So this is the main line. And then bishop c4. So... There's this pin on the d-file, and this is a very important theme in this position. Now, the main move here is knight e4, but Carlson played king b1, uh, which is also very reasonable, and well, it's rather similar. And here, Jones has played rook b8 on three occasions, making three draws. Now, he has good results for that. Um, but today, he played rook e8 very, very quickly, so clearly... You know, he's well prepared, knows the position backwards. Rook e8 protects the bishop. Sometimes it can be useful, once the queen moves, to be able to move the knight away, and then you can recapture with the rook. But also sometimes the f8 square is made available for the bishop. Carlson now thought for 21 minutes, and he admitted after the game that he was actually a little bit surprised by the dragon. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and, he, you know, he admitted that his opponent knew this position much better than he did. So, yes, 21 minutes, he thought, over knight e4. A very natural move in this position, of course. Just looking at these two squares, preparing to hassle that incredibly important light square bishop. And here, well, previously queen c7 has been played, but bishop c5, um, well, it's rather typical for this variation, and white has, I think, positional trumps here. Uh, I mean, this was a game between Peter Lecco and, and Lawrence Trent from 2016, and, and Lecco won a very nice positional game, actually. You can see that 
White's minor pieces are excellently placed here. And, I mean, Black tries to stir things up and get some kind of attack. But if he doesn't, then, you know, those, those pieces stand very well. But instead of Queen C7, Garwain played f5 very, very quickly, so obviously still in his opening preparation. Now, knight c5 is possible, but the bishop drops back to f7, and I think on this diagonal, supporting the knight, it is very well placed. So instead of that, Magnus played knight g5, attacking the bishop. Well, black can't allow that bishop to be taken. So the bishop dropped back to c8, which um, is a bit unfortunate to have to move the bishop back. And here Magnus thought for three minutes, but perhaps he should have thought for a little longer in this position, because he played what for me is perhaps one of the worst blunders he's ever made in his career in classical chess, because it seems so obvious. <laughs> He played g4 here. Well, we'll look at that in a second. Basically, he should protect this knight. He should play h4. And this is just a very, very sharp position. I mean, black can you know, maybe play rook b8, maybe a5. It's really, really sharp. But after g4, the move played, Garwin just played f4 incredibly simple attacking the bishop but also attacking the knight that's why h4 had to be played just to protect that knight I mean, this is quite extraordinary and magnus could find nothing better than to, to protect the knight with the h pawn and the bishop got taken and white has one pawn for the piece and his pieces are quite active Nevertheless, this should just be a winning position for black. Well, we say that, of course, now the nerves kick in. If Garwin had had this against, well, practically any other player, I think he would have won. But when the eyes of the world are watching your game, you know that people, millions of people, could be millions, are watching this game all over the world, certainly thousands. Not to mention in the in the tournament hall itself, this is not an easy proposition. There are still some problems to solve, of course. H6. Well, that seems reasonable to try and knock the knight away, but Magnus played queen c5, attacking the pawn here. So if pawn takes knight, then queen takes, and well, even this isn't so clear, but but obviously white has one uh, at least a pawn back. So after queen c5, Garmin played bishop b7 just to guard that pawn and also protecting the knight as well. Knight e6, no, excuse me, knight e4 and then rook e6 was played but I mean maybe it's simpler just to play bishop f8 knock the queen back and then put the king in the corner just to try and escape, well, at least escape one pin. Uh, that's one possible way of dealing with it, but rook e6 is certainly not a bad move, covering the d6 square and also protecting this slightly vulnerable pawn on g6. h5 from Carlsen. And here, again, bishop f8 looks very natural. Why didn't Garwin play this? Bishop f8, knocking the queen back, and then, of course, close the position on the king's side with g5. Of course, white still has some activity here. You know, maybe Carlson can try at some point and, and bring some pieces on, onto this long, on this diagonal here, but it's, it's certainly not easy. Why didn't Garwin play this? Well, I think. He wanted to make sure that he traded queens to try and snuff out any counterplay. And so that's why in this position, instead of bishop f8, he wanted to try and, well, trap white's queen. He obviously felt if he could trade queens, then there'd be no danger. But now Magnus seizes the moment and he played g5. Of course, trading queens 
in this particular position would be a terrible mistake. The knight hits rook and bishop. The rook goes back. Trade on b7 and white wins back material because of a fork here. It's still possible to attack the queen with bishop f8. But then white wouldn't trade immediately, but just bring the queen back to g1. And now, in view of the weakened state of black's king, of course, black should trade. But here you can see, although white is still a piece down, the rooks are in the perfect position. Well, all, all white's pieces stand well, and the position is breaking open. The problem is these pieces are just reduced to the role of bystanders while white gets on with his kingside initiative. This is the problem. So g5 just played. So Garwin decides to take this. And now Magnus slipped away with the queen. And this is already very, very difficult for black. Even though he's still a piece up, the kingside is opening. Um, this pin here on this diagonal is really irritating. Rook b8 played. The problem is it's just very difficult to quell White's initiative here. You know, there's no way you can simplify the position. Very unpleasant. Uh, Carlson played a very practical move here. B3. He could have taken on G5, but a really practical move, just stopping any threats on the B file. And it doesn't so matter about the weakness of the c3 square because that's covered by the knight, but also it's going to be very difficult for black to escape from this pin as well. Queen d8, protecting the pawn on g5. And now a very cool move from Magnus. He simply captured that pawn on a7, and by this stage it's already absolutely horrible for black. It's just impossible to get out of this bind. The knight can't move. The rook doesn't really have anywhere good to go to. The bishop can't move. Um, the queen has to keep hold of the rook and the rook has to keep protecting the bishop and so on. It's just a miserable position. G takes h5. That was recaptured. Rook g6 trying to hold everything together but now a simple move. Rook takes g5 because, of course, the queen can't take the knight because the rook is hanging. Queen c8, trying to keep everything protected. Rook g1, really simple, just moving back, moving to the g-file. Attacking the queen, queen b6, so that just keeps an eye on the bishop, keeps black really tied up and there could be the chance simply to trade here and to swing the queen over into the attack or maybe support the knight as well. Therefore rook a6. Um, not bishop takes rook because then the queen would be on prees, there'd be no pin there. But the queen just nudges back to c5. And black just can't get out of this bind. You know, the, the rook is going nowhere. I mean, all all black's pieces are absolutely terrible. They're either uh, miserably placed or, or in a pin. Queen d7 played. Knight e4, simple move, keeping control and threatening a deadly check on f6 with a fork. Therefore, king h8, but now the queen just came back threatening a check and knight f6 check. So queen e7 stops the, the knight f6 idea, but now Galway, uh, Magnus just took on a6, just took the rook, queen check and moved in. So, I mean, Magnus is even um, ahead on material now, rook and two pawns against two minor pieces. White's pieces are just dominating here completely. There's, there really is no defence at all. That attacks the rook. That checks the king. 
And now rook g5 threatening rook f5. And, well, this the end is nothing to do. Knight c5, beautiful square. Hitting this, threatening checks. Oh, it's just horrible. And that was the last move of the game. Rook takes bishop. Um, if king takes, then check. And here, white is three pawns up with a winning position. So an incredible turnaround uh, by Magnuson. He admitted after the game, of course, he was terribly lucky. Although he said that afterwards, once he blundered this piece, he felt, you know, there was no pressure on him at all. He could play with a free hand. But still, um, I feel very sorry for Garwin Jones. He's an excellent player, but nerves must have got to him. Well, that win leaves Magnus in joint first, along with Anish Giri and Shahri and Mamadyarov. Uh, in other results today, um, Giri defeated Mamadyarov. Uh, Mamadyarov had a terrible game, actually. He crumbled really badly. Uh, Caruana defeated Hoi Fan. She's having a rotten time. So let's look at the scores. Giri, Carlson and Mamadyarov share the lead with five and a half. Kramnik and So on five. And, well, at the bottom of the tournaments, we have Hoyifan on one out of eight, Aliban on two, Caruana a bit of a comeback with three out of eight, but he's having a terrible tournament. So, Monday is a rest day. And if you want full details of this round, please do go to chessbase.com for a detailed report. So, I shall see you Tuesday for more analysis.